building up a young wrestling enterprise, administrators sometimes find that the free agent pool is a little bit light on stars because all of the big names would likely be signed already. Occasionally, however, organizations in that position luck out when in the midst of scouring for fresh blood. A rare uncut gem enters their field of vision. In 2004, an unheralded, uniquely charismatic talent was given the forum to build their name, with seemingly only air and space separating them from the top of the heap. But within three years of what should have been their crowning moment, this individual was out of the business entirely, never to return. Nearly 14 years after his last match, he remains to many an unforgettable curiosity. I'm Jack from Cultaholic, and this is the story of Monty Brown, the alpha male. Monty Brown was born in Saginaw, Michigan on April 13th, 1970. As a teenager, Brown found himself enamored by the colorful world of professional wrestling. Years later, he admitted that his childhood bedroom walls were adorned with posters of wrestling greats, with one wall in particular dedicated to the nature boy, Ric Flair. Though he was naturally athletic, Brown didn't initially pursue wrestling at the appropriate age, instead going down a path that many future wrestlers take, football. He attended Ferris State in his native Michigan, where he made his presence felt as a hard-hitting linebacker. Ferris State, however, isn't exactly the strongest pipeline into the NFL, but Brown made his way into the league anyway, signing with the Buffalo Bills as an undrafted free agent in 1993. The 240-plus pound Brown was active for 13 regular games in Buffalo that season and went on to play in the Super Bowl loss to the Dallas Cowboys. After three seasons in Buffalo as a reserve linebacker and a member of the special teams unit, Brown signed with the New England Patriots for the 1996 campaign. There, he earned more time as a starter, recording 34 tackles across seven starts. Once more, Brown was part of a Super Bowl team, but unfortunately fell short again as the Patriots went down to Brett Favre and the Green Bay Packers. Citing a chronic ankle injury, Brown made the 1996 season his last in the NFL and was retired by the age of 27. But all was not lost. As Brown himself tells it, his signing with the Patriots was spurred by an ulterior motive. While he apparently had offers from other teams, Brown chose New England because of its relative proximity to Stamford, Connecticut, the home, of course, of WWF's offices. The wrestling dream had clearly not subsided. With football now in his past, Brown sought wrestling training from two fellow Michiganders, UFC legend Dan the Beast 7 and renowned ECW madman Sabu. It wasn't until more than three years after his last pro football game that Brown wrestled his first match, beginning his squared circle career on the Michigan independence scene in the year 2000. Before long, he took on his nickname, the Alpha Male. In July of 2002, 32-year-old Brown got his first chance at wrestling on the national stage when he appeared on the third ever weekly pay-per-view of the upstart Total Nonstop Action. His first match was a veritable squash as he destroyed local wrestler Anthony Ingram in under 90 seconds, finishing with a powerball. On the other hand, Brown certainly had a presence about him. He was muscular, had an obvious physical charisma, and unlike many other heavyweights on the TNA scene, nobody could call him a WWE cast-off. That said, he did appear fairly green, even in a short match, but that was something that time and experience could help remedy. But TNA didn't afford him all that much time. In the weeks ahead, Brown wrestled four more matches for TNA, including a win over primetime Elix Skipper in a Detroit street fight, and a loss to NWA world champion Ron The Truth Killings, and then departed by the early autumn. Brown later chalked up his quick exit to a lack of discernible identity for him, especially in a company that itself was trying to establish a firm identity and constantly shuffled things around. For the next year and a half, Brown gained further experience on his local indie scene. Opponents in this time included trainer Sabu, as well as Cole Cabana, Chris Hero, and even Kevin Sullivan. But on March 10th, 2004, Brown was summoned back to TNA with another opportunity, and this time, he was gonna stay for a while. For this go around, Brown was now firmly established as a heel. Contrary to his earlier TNA foray, his alpha male handle was more firmly defined this time around, as Brown claimed to hail from the Serengeti. Brown made it clear that any and all opponents were feeble prey, poor souls with the misfortune of treading upon his hunting grounds. Brown's entrance theme was a not at all veiled knockoff of Disturbed's Down With The Sickness, complete with a sounder like drop of David Draymond's staccato grunt. But while the song was a watered down rendering of a contemporary piece, 
piece, there was a palpable intensity to it, and it at least fit Brown's fervid demeanour. Speaking of intense, Brown's finisher of choice was an invention fitting for his overall aesthetic, the pounce. After sending his victim hard into the ropes or the opposing turnbuckles, Brown sprung off the ropes and launched at a perpendicular angle towards the staggering opponent, smashing them with a life-altering shoulder block that was practically a scoliosis dispenser. In other words, it looked brutal. Others have done the pounce in the years since, but there's always that contrived movement by the victim towards the ropes so that the attacker can better yeet them, essentially, over the top and to the floor. Here, no contrivance was necessary, as Brown's version looked impressive enough on the merit of the car crash-like impact. Build at 265 pounds and utilizing the aggressive charge of the pro linebacker that realistically he was, Brown did not need an exaggeration to make the pounce look lethal. While his ring work had improved and Brown looked like star material between the ropes, it was his promos that resonated most. To put it simply, nobody in 2004 was cutting promos quite like Monty Brown, and frankly, nobody really has since. With his face contorted into a rigid grimace, Brown alternated between violent threats and comic whimsy. He compared his various opponents to different docile animals while affirming the horrible things that he, the alpha male was going to do to them out on nature's battleground. Then he'd ad-lib with bizarre sound effects or perhaps menacing remarks towards interviewer Scott Hudson. You never quite knew what his promos would consist of, and it's quite possible that even as Brown stepped in front of the interview set, he didn't quite know either. Monty Brown had that rare old school ability to deliver promos that sounded both focused and unfocused at the same time. In a wrestling world filled with far too many paint by numbers interviews, that's not a bad thing at all. Though he was supposed to be a heel, it was pretty damn hard to boo Monty Brown. At worst, he may have been a bit rough around the edges, but that was really his charm. There was a sense that anything could happen when Brown appeared in front of the camera lens, and fans quickly caught on to that. And they caught on even more as his body count started rising. Sabu, Road Dog, D'Lo Brown, and Ron Killings were his victims over the months ahead. He even dominated future WWE stars like MVP and Connor of the Ascension in squash matches. By the time TNA kicked off their monthly pay-per-view Era, Brown was turned babyface on the strength of his overall performances. That November, he guested on Fox Sports Net series, The Best Damn Sports Show, period, coming off very well in his interview. He then teamed with co-host and fellow ex-NFL roughneck Brian Cox in a tag team match on the program, looking more like a star each and every minute. And as those monthly pay-per-views began, Brown quickly picked up victories over stalwart heels Raven and Abyss, as it became quite evident that TNA was going all in on Monty. And come the dawn of 2005, Brown found himself near the apex. At January's final resolution pay-per-view, eternal world champion Jeff Jarrett was supposed to defend against 52-year-old macho man Randy Savage. However, Savage pulled out of the event some time earlier, and TNA now had a giant void in their main event picture. To remedy this, Brown was placed into a three-way number one contenders match the night of the event against former WCW champions Kevin Nash and Diamond Dallas Page. The winner would get Jarrett at the end of the evening for the belt. Brown outlasted the two veterans to earn the shot, and it looked for all the world like TNA was about to make a new star. Jarrett was a reliable placeholder, but Brown appeared to be the man for now and for tomorrow. The media appearances, the momentum, him, the rare energy, the lightning in a bottle mystique, it was all there, but it wasn't meant to be. Following a typically overbooked finishing sequence to the world title bout, Jarrett survived the pounce and finished off Brown with the El Cabon guitar shot, followed by three strokes. One could reason that TNA didn't want to deviate from the long-term plan, and that Jarrett was ferrying the title until later on in the year, where designated face of the company AJ Styles would be the one to dethrone him. And there's an obvious merit to that thinking, but you can't help but see the missed opportunity. At worst, if Brown wasn't going to win that night, he probably shouldn't have been in the match at all. While the loss did protect Brown to the extent that Jarrett had to do pretty much everything to slay him, why is Monty Brown taking a pinfall loss right now? And then, it would only get worse. Following a lamely executed feud with a Terminator-like wrestler named Triton, Brown suddenly and inexplicably turned heel, helping Jarrett retain the gold over DDP that March. Not only could he not beat the lukewarm title holder, he was now playing second fiddle to him in the storylines, being just his broad-shouldered sidekick. In the months ahead, Brown soldiered on as a mid-card heel, teaming with Billy Gunn for a time being before breaking off on his own again. Attempts were made to rebuild him as a singles heel, and a win over Jeff Hardy that November was a show of good faith. However, he then ceded losses to TNA's new biggest star in Christian Cage after the popular name jumped ship from WWE. One loss came at Destination X in March of 2006 for Christian's World Heavyweight title. By that time, 14 months had passed since TNA stumbled at the line while completing Brown's championship circuit. 
and recapturing that lost feeling felt far from an imminent proposition. Through the summer months, Brown worked with fellow bruisers in Samoa Joe and Rhino and came out on the losing end of a well-received three-way dance that August at Hard Justice. The match, as well as an improvised promo that he cut that night during an in-show delay, was effectively Brown's last hurrah with TNA, and he left shortly thereafter, following the expiration of his contract. A two and a half year run with TNA, if we don't count the two months he spent there in 2002, yielded no championships in spite of the otherworldly momentum and palpable buzz he'd created for himself as the unconventional alpha male. To this day, fans and critics remain mystified that TNA failed to pull the trigger on the guy the meme of Jarrett wins lol aside. But TNA's loss, well that seemed to be somebody else's gain. That November, Brown signed a contract with WWE and made his formal debut on the ECW brand two months later. He did so with a new name, as while he kept his alpha male nickname, he traded in Monty Brown to become the curiously named Marcus Corvon. The pounce remained his finisher, but his theme song, well, that was another story. Replacing the Disturbed ripoff was a light and jazzy piece called Smooth that, while catchy, didn't exactly match the ferocity of the wrestler it belonged to. On ECW, Brown received the traditional beginner's push, toppling enhancement talents while giving fits to extreme gatekeepers like Balls Mahoney, The Sandman, and Tommy Dreamer. Corvon soon entered into a stable called The New Breed, a group of heels that endeavoured to take control of ECW from the time-tested originals. Flanked by Matt Stryker, Elijah Burke and Kevin Thorne, the quartet battled four ECW originals at WrestleMania 23 in Detroit, but fell short when Stryker was pinned by Rob Van Dam. Though the group did manage to win a rematch two nights later on the Tuesday ECW show, none of the four were particularly building ahead of steam, Corvon included. The new breed soon dissolved following a calculated undermining from CM Punk, freeing Corvon to stand on his own two feet. Could he reclaim the faded momentum of his earlier TNA push as a single star? Well, we'll never really know. In mid-June, Corvon was one of four competitors in a mini-tournament to crown a new ECW champion following Bobby Lashley's abdication of the belt. He wrestled Punk while Burke took on Chris Benoit, but that night gained a bit of infamy as it marked Benoit's final match before that whole tragic circumstance. Little did anyone realize that after Corvon lost to Punk in the other semi-final, he'd never wrestle again either. Brown disappeared from WWE television due to what was termed personal issues at the time. Three months after that match with Punk, Brown requested his release and got it. It was later revealed that Brown's sister had sadly passed away and he went home to help raise her children. Brown maintains that he walked away from WWE on good terms and that the door may have been open for a possible return. However, Brown opted to leave his childhood dream behind. He had wrestled his last match at the age of 37, less than three years after receiving his first world title push on the national stage. In the years since, Brown became a personal trainer in his hometown of Saginaw. There, he developed his own fitness program called Alpha One and also started his own line of athletic wear called Scripture Clothing. Many years later, Brown resurfaced a few times in the wrestling world, albeit in non-active capacities. Fellow former TNA star Robert Roode shared a photo of the two together at a WWE house show in Saginaw in February 2019, with Brown sporting a fuller beard than we're accustomed to seeing. Reports also indicated that Brown visited several tapings of Impact Wrestling. It was revealed in 2020 that after Brown made those backstage appearances, attempts were made to convince him to return to the ring. But Brown chose not to budge, however, and remains happily in retirement. Good for him. The same year, Brown appeared in a social media video endorsing another old TNA peer in Lance Archer, ahead of Archer's challenge of AEW world champion John Moxley. At age 50, there is no doubt that Monty Brown's non sequitur laden promo style had that same vibrant energy about it. To watch Monty Brown cut that promo on Moxley was to hearken all the way back to 2004, where Brown first infused that weekly TNA pay-per-view schedule with his signature spiel. He felt like a main eventer back then, and honestly, even at 50, he still kind of feels like he could be a main eventer today. It's hard to believe that nearly a decade and a half has passed since Brown flew across wrestling rings, jarring one poor soul after another with his shoulder, once more establishing his loftiness on the squared circle food chain. For reasons that are very noble and understandable, Monty Brown walked away, but it doesn't keep one from wondering, what if? What if TNA rode the wave and had him pulverize Jarrett that night in 2005? What if TNA held off on the match until a later date where they'd have perhaps been less married to their already ordained plans and more keen on making good with Brown's surging popularity? The truth is, Brown could have acquired all available accolades in those interim years and still walked away when he did. You just never really know. 
Archer shared video aside, Monty Brown as a wrestler is relegated to memories, history, and archival footage. Reminders of just how special a talent and personality he was. Even when viewed for the first time by a newer fan in 2021, there's a certain magic to seeing somebody in wrestling that cannot exactly be duplicated by anyone else, regardless of their own skill set. That in itself shows the appeal of the alpha male. If wrestlers in the years since could replicate his promos, display his precise intensity, and co-opt all of his unsuppressed mannerisms, he may have faded into the dustbin of history. But the fact that Monty Brown, more than a decade into retirement and without a single major championship to his name, remains such a curiosity really speaks volumes about how he made fans feel. We may see a hundred more versions of your favorite in-ring performer before we'll ever see a second Monty Brown. Period.